here we are. Welcome everybody to this conversation about uh, ministry with um, our local schools in the midst of their efforts to reopen in person virtually in the ways uh, churches can connect with students, teachers, uh, and families in this moment. So uh, let us pray. Oh, good and gracious God, we give you thanks that you are with us and that you walk with us uh, even through these uh, uncertain times that, that continue. God, we pray particularly for students and parents and teachers and administrators and all of those who are facing difficult decisions and uh, face the challenge of, of making plans for continuing the education of young people in our communities. God, we pray that, uh, that your grace would sustain them and cover them. We pray that you would give them wisdom. And God, we pray uh, that you would open our eyes to the possibilities for your church to come alongside them and to be a blessing to all of those different groups um, as they walk this difficult road. God bless our time together. Uh, may it be fruitful. Uh, may it spark um, ideas and give us new insight for ways that we can be the church in these days. It's in Christ's name that we pray. Amen. All right. So um, I already gave a little bit of the background uh, prior to starting the recording. Um, let's just let's jump right back uh, right into it. Uh, we're grateful to have. Uh, Reverend Tom Palmer and, and Bonnie. And I'm Bonnie, I don't know how to say your last name. Would you help me with that? Bonnie, you're muted. Sorry. How do you say your last name? Knipe. Knipe. Okay, great. Uh, both are from First United Methodist Church in Mesquite, and I think are going to be very helpful to us as we uh, begin by uh, thinking specifically about the opportunity of using our church facilities, which of course are being um, underutilized in this season, um, using those church facilities to provide um, safe, supportive space for virtual learning for students in our communities. Um, and so again, that was the idea that emerged on Facebook that really sparked this gathering today. So we want to begin there after we talk about this specific idea, we'll broaden the conversation and consider other ways that the church can, uh, can be administering these days. So um, uh, with that, Tom, why don't I turn it to you and uh, maybe you can introduce Bonnie since she's new to us and then tell us a little bit about um, how this uh, ministry opportunity emerged in your context and what you're doing and what you've learned and share the resources with the group. So Tom. All right, thanks. Sure. Thanks. I appreciate it. And Catherine, thanks for the initial, at least I think that was the initial Facebook. And I'm not a big Facebook guy. So responding to your Facebook, I had no idea it would generate and lead to something like this. Because, uh, but that's, that's the beauty of the connection. And I appreciate, appreciate the opportunity to get some other in, input and see how we can improve a model that we're trying to roll out. Bonnie tonight is our director of what we call, now Bonnie, don't laugh. Faith prep, prep, faith prep, faith preparatory. <laughs> I have trouble with preparatory, so it's just faith prep. But faith prep is our private kindergarten, and we're starting that this year. It's been a kind of a hit and miss start and non start and stop process, but we're fortunate that we have a family life center building which is separate from our the rest of our campus. It's across a breezeway from the sanctuary building. The first floor of that building has Academy Kids, and that's the basically from about six months to pre-K. They're in that building, and they utilize the entire ground floor of that facility. The second floor is has been just nothing. Uh, we didn't want to interact with kids, there's security issues, so the second floor was utilized for nothing. So the idea of a private kindergarten be a natural transition from Academy Kids straight into Faith Prep came about. And Bonnie's done all the, the legwork on putting that private kindergarten together. But as we were talking about it and this whole evolving situation of COVID and school openings and school not opening, virtual learning, I don't know who came up with the original idea, but it sort of dawned on the collective group that 
uh, what do you do if you're working parents and you've got to home home school your kids? And I think it was Bonnie that said, you know, wait a minute. Our mission at our church is love God, love your neighbor and serve the community. We've got these other classrooms. We're going to utilize one classroom for faith prep this year, but we've got these other classrooms on the other wing of the upstairs. Why don't we create this space where we can have supervised, help the kids, parents can drop them off and have some form of safety where they can have a place for virtual learning. And then that evolved into, and I think you've got the brochure that Bonnie came up with, uh, Virtual Learning Support Center. We call it Support Center because we want to be very careful that it's, we're not Virtual Learning Center. Uh, we're simply offering support to parents. I had a conversation a couple of Fridays ago with one of our school board members, and he, he dropped his fork in the middle of his uh, breakfast eggs when I was talking about this concept. And he said, that's genius. You're helping the school district. How are you getting the word out? I said, well, it'd be nice if the school district could help us get the word out, but <laughs> they can't. So the school district's very, very supportive of this effort. They think it's great. It's an opportunity to, to fill a demand and the need, and it fits our mission perfectly. So that's where Virtual Learning Support Center came from. I'm going to let Bonnie fill in. Bonnie Kneipp, who said, is our director of Faith Prep. She officially came on board as paid staff just a couple of weeks ago, and I'm and she's a longtime member of the church, and I'm thrilled to, thrilled to have her in that position. But she's going to be coordinating the Virtual Learning Support Center also, and she has a lot more information about it than I do, and looking forward to all y'all's input as well. So, so Bonnie, why don't you get into the details of how this thing's going to work? Okay. Um, well, as Tom said, we're going to utilize the other wing that's not going to be associated with faith prep. I mean, there's a shared entrance, um, a secured shared entrance downstairs. And then at the top of the stairway, if you walk straight, that'll be the faith prep wing. But as Tom mentioned, we have these empty classrooms that we'd like to utilize. Um, I spoke with our AK director because they're under state guidelines and talked about the actual square footage of the room and how many children we could put in there. Um, their recommendations or their guideline is 35 to 40 square feet per child. So with those numbers and then the social distancing numbers, we figured out or I figured out how many children we could accommodate. Um, at first, I was going to use the four rooms that are available. But after some discussion, we decided to leave one room empty um, for activities. It was originally going to be used for the indoor recess area of Faith Prep. So there could be times when it's utilized for um, like an, an indoor activity area, or we've also, um, thanks to somebody's great idea, and God forbid in case somebody were to get sick during the day, a child, we would be able to isolate them from the rest of the children. Um, as we see it, the rooms are going to be um, like little pods the children will be in. At first, I was like, well, we could just have the children come up for school. They could complete their um, needed hours for the day, and then they can go downstairs to a schooler program for Academy Kids. But after lots of discussion with fellow educators and parents, we realized that it would probably be best if they were more self-contained. So that's where this idea came from to kind of keep them in pods, if you will. Um, the children will have a table and um, we're even going to allow them to use some like fancy wiki tape to decorate their little floor space so they know that that's their area, that's their office, that's their place every day. Um, additionally, the children um, will be issued devices from the district. So that's a huge you know, plus for us. We may need some additional backup devices just in case there's an issue with a, a laptop or an iPad, or um, if there were to be a need for, sometimes children need to do uh, something on a different device. So if that need were to arise, then we could help facilitate that. Um, so keeping the children in small groups in their classrooms, we looked at numbers and felt that one facilitator per eight children would probably be a reasonable fit for both the facilitator and the children. I haven't decided yet how the children will be housed within their pods. I might do it based on grade level. And we talked about how the need for care is for everybody from kindergarten through, you know, basically age 12. Um, but we decided that we would primarily focus on first grade through fourth grade 
being our majority of, or the primary area we would like to focus on for children in that, that area, that age range. I did have a call from a parent about kindergarten. Um, after some communication and some, some more discussion, she's decided that she's probably going to do use our faith prep. So that's a, another way that we can branch out and use those facilities. But to see the children in their little pods, in their groups, the facilitators will, as I said, help them with their activities. Um, let's see, what else? I have two, two um, shifts, if you will, of employment, one from 8 a.m a.m. until 1 and then 1 to 6 p.m. to allow that, you know, in-house child care facility. Once the children are done with their mandated uh, moments or minutes in time, I know that in Mesquite, they said that pre-K through fourth grade will need to complete um, a minimum of 180 minutes face-to-face, -face, or not face-to-face, -face, excuse me, but 180 minutes of time logged in. Students will need to log in by 8 a.m., and then spend their time working through their assignments. Additionally, they will have to have daily contact with their, um, with their assigned, with their homeroom teacher and complete all tasks. So the facilitators will be there to be sure they get logged on in time. They're tracking their moments. I'm pretty sure that it will self-track their time, but just we'll have to work through that once we see a better model of, of exactly how that's going to work. But the facilitator will be responsible for not doing the work for the child, but helping them through them, guiding them through any technical issues, difficulties, logging in, creating assignments, you know, being sure they've had that communication with their adult. Once that is over, we the children will be bringing their own lunch. And then after lunchtime in the afternoon, we intend to use that time for, um, like STEM activities, enrichment activities, or even if the teacher noticed or the facilitator noticed that the child was struggling with an issue or struggling with a concept, we can create a little bit of a one-on-one -on -one or maybe even a small group socially distant tutoring session for that child. So supporting them through their learning that is going to be provided within their school district, but helping out people, helping out the parents so they don't have to worry about completing it at night or what are they going to do to get those moments, um, you know, that the children need to be logged in. Um, I think that's pretty much, we have a wonderful communications director that created the little logo. She saw my vision and, and went with that. So we got flyers. I intend to get out to facilities within our district or within our neighborhood. I tried this in the spring to or last spring to promote faith prep and found that many businesses are unable to post flyers. Um, they're willing to put them in their break room, but even like Hobby Lobby and Mardell, they don't publicly display flyers anymore. So that's been an issue that we've had to, you know, kind of work around. Word is getting out. I do plan to make a stop at daycares and facilities around. Maybe there's a like a privately owned coffee shop or small mom and pop businesses in the area and the surrounding area where we can display and get the word out, you know, to even more people that this will be a, an opportunity for them and a, and a service that we're providing at our church. I think that's pretty much the rundown. Thanks, of it. Bonnie. Sure. So as you were talking, um, several folks were asking questions in the chat. Uh, I'm just looking at that. I may um, curate some of those and okay. I can keep the conversation going. So, sure. um, so uh, you were describing the ratio of students to adults, uh, mm -hmm. eight to one, and um, Jessica Wright, who's at First United Methodist in Allen, asks, um, "How will y'all?" accommodate uh, ministry safe uh, requirements. Is that something you thought about? Yeah. Bonnie, you want to handle that? You want me to? Yes, the facilitators will need to complete the ministry safe background. Yes, but ministry safe training that we have in place. Yes. And if, if I understand right, a part of that is, um, you know, if there's an enclosed space that mm -hmm. the norm is that two adults would be in that space. Mm -hmm. Right, with children at all times. We do intend to have two. Um, we're hoping to get up to 16 children and have okay. the two. If not, I will make myself available. I'm just right, you know, a couple doors away. So we will be sure that that's. Um, and I'm a facilitator as also kind of um, standing between almost the doorways. 
to be able to be visible um, and to be able to assist the children. Mm -hmm. But that's, you know, that's something that I will need to, um, making a note for myself to make sure that I am aware of and follow through with. Good. And, and just know, I'm asking, I'm posing these questions from the group to you. It helps all of us to hear you talk through them. Um, it helps all of us problem solve them, I think. Um, so, Dreetha Burris, uh, who's at First United Methodist in Rowlett, just asks about how many kids are you thinking will be in each classroom? I'm sorry, I'm having my internet cutting it out. I didn't hear the beginning of your question. Um, the question is how many kids will be in each classroom? Okay, we have broken it down based on the square footage and we're going to have a room of up to five, another, a second room of up to five children and a third room that can accommodate six children. All right. Um, Catherine Strimke is asking a question about, um, and Catherine, I may ask you to elaborate, but essentially, you know, what, what relationship do, uh, if we're gonna offer an, a program like this, do we need to have with the state of Texas? Um, what do we need to tell them? Um, you okay. Know, <laughs> um, yeah, Bonnie, before you answer that one, we've, we've been trying to get the Academy Kids program moved upstairs and that we cannot do that that's a licensed state child care facility and it cannot be on the second floor period uh, between the city fire marshal and the state fire marshal nobody wanting to have the responsibility for signing the final permit i plan to go to the legislature when all this mess is finished and do some more lobbying to see if we can't get that changed but it's very, that's a pretext to say it's very important that this is not a child care facility licensed by the state of Texas. So we're in contact with the um, Academy Kids child care provider. Uh, we have a good relationship with that individual, but the state of Texas has no licensing requirements for something like this that we're doing. Same thing with our private kindergarten. There's no state licensing requirements on that. Okay, well, my question is that the state of Texas does require being notified even if it's a home child care um, with three or more children and so somewhere in there is going to be that fuzzy line between notifying the state of texas and having to meet some sort of licensing requirements and especially if those of us who are just looking at these online school days until they're allowed to go back in person theoretically speaking we're only talking about 15 days altogether. And I just, I've been trying to read the Texas State website, it's not helping. <laughs> right. I think um, the key, as, go ahead, go Bonnie. Ahead. Okay, thank you. As Tom mentioned, we do have a grandparent of an Academy Kids student who is aware of our plan for up here. And she has um, contacted somebody that works within the state by the name of Angela Washington. And Angela and I have been communicating through email been submitted forms um, as I said I completed them submitted them so we should be good to go to receive an exemption yeah Bonnie you, you cut out a little bit on that oh, why did you uh, said Angela Washington is our contact person after yes. that it cut out Okay, um, she is our contact person with the state for the um, regulations and I have completed the exemption forms that she said would be necessary for us to go ahead and have faith prep and virtual learning upstairs. And Aunt, Bonnie, if you can send those to us, Andy, if you can post those on the resource page, we'd be happy to share those. And do you want the blank document or do you want my completed documents? I don't know, give them all the details. No, <laughs> no. Send, send the <laughs> blank in the form. Yeah, S send both. And okay. we can put that up so everybody can have access to it. And Catherine, to your point about, you know, 15 days, we think that you're probably, hopefully you're right, but we don't know. We don't know how long this will last. And we don't know how many parents, even if the, and who knows what Ken Paxton's going to do next or the, or the governor. I mean, that's just a crapshoot. So we're preparing that this could be a long-term uh, program. 
because there may be parents that simply say they're not comfortable sending their kids back and districts may well say um, you may homeschool your your children and so, and actually ken paxton is the reason i'm betting on 15 days because yesterday <laughs> He leaned on the TEA not to give the same amount of money to the school districts who are doing online as opposed to in person. So I'm still betting on 15 days. Ugh. Yeah, I think there will still be a need for parents to have some sort of virtual learning support center. Well, I know in our community, what they're doing is allowing parents to choose between either sending your children or signing up for the virtual learning. And they're talking about it being long term. They're not just referring to it as a 15 day solution. They're last week. That was the, you know, the latest um, options that they were giving parents and then children were free to flip between the two if they wound up that you know, the virtual learning wasn't working, they felt safer or more comfortable, they could attend school or vice versa. And that could happen every nine weeks with an elementary age child. So we could have, you know, quite a turnaround at some times that we could have a, a rotating attendance policy or a rotating attendance for the students. Yeah, I would just add to that by saying uh, the school where my daughter goes, she's in middle school, uh, they have those same options. There are 1,100 students at her school. Um, by last count, 600 of those 1,100 opted for virtual learning. So there are a lot of children and a lot of families who, when given the choice, are not comfortable with sending their kids back to the school buildings. Mm -hmm. So, um, all right. So I think, uh, Bonnie, I think you addressed a question also from Dreetha asking if uh, or maybe Tom addressed it about if there's a need to apply for a child care license for this kind of program. Tom, I think you said that that's not needed. Did I hear you right? Right. Just the forms that Bonnie will forward, you can post the exemption forms. Okay. Um, someone asked about snacks, if y'all mm -hmm. were providing snacks as a part of your program. Um, we're going to allow for snack time. Um, with COVID, we feel it would probably be best if the children brought their own snacks. And we plan to have a refrigerator up here to, to keep snacks that might be cold or lunches cold and have a microwave so that we can, you know, take care of their the food needs that they have. Yeah, snacks, so water bottles. Mm -hmm. yeah. There are a couple of questions about the facilitators. Um, are you paying the facilitators? Um, and I guess a related question, I know is answered in the flyer I've seen, but um, you know, are you charging parents for this um, experience? So maybe talk a little bit about, I guess, the financial side of the model. Okay. Um, we are charging, or we are paying the facilitators $12 an hour. Um, that rate was decided upon based on the amount that Academy Kids employees are paid and what our faith prep teacher is paid. It's kind of right in the middle. So we thought that was a, a fair amount. Um, when I was trying to secure a teacher for faith prep, I found that many people are not wanting to commit to a five day. I'm thinking of retired people or people that I was in touch with that were in my little group of educators weren't wanting to commit to the five days. So with the the development of the virtual learning center it's intended to hopefully get some people who have obviously education experience or you know at least experience working with children in the setting and some tech some tech knowledge so they can facilitate in the best way possible um let's see what else So they would be paid $12 an hour. It's basically split into the two shifts, a morning shift and an afternoon. The morning is five hours, the afternoon is six. And I'm sorry, vice versa, morning six, afternoon is five. So as long as the hours were covered, I would be open to flexible scheduling for the facilitators. For example, if somebody needed to work mornings and have the afternoon off or flip that, that would be, we could work that out. I know some people, um, might just want to have a working job two days a week or three days a week. So as long as we could work the staff and we could work out a schedule that would be beneficial to the employees and the students, I'm open to those possibilities. When it came to what to charge, um, 
my whole reasoning for this idea was I didn't want children, I don't want children to be at home unattended. I don't want older children to have to worry about or middle high school children to have to worry about educating their younger siblings. So with much thought and looking at prices, the typical daycare price for this summer is about $130. Some of course are a little bit higher, some are a little bit lower. So after much discussion with parents, parents are like, oh, I'd pay a whole lot for that. I didn't want to see this as a money-making opportunity. I wanted to be able to cover the cost of our staff and then provide a little bit for the use of the building. So we came up with $130 per week, and those are for the hours of 7 a.m. until 1 p.m. And then if extended care is needed, um, the facility will be open from 7 a.m. to 6 p.m. and that cost would be $150. So that's where those, those amounts came from. Um, mm -hmm. Talking with people in surrounding areas and like I said, most daycares are about 130 a week. So figuring if they've been paying that throughout the summer, it's not going to make a huge, huge difference in their budgeting for the fall and who knows how long after if need be. Great. Um, looking at the chat, uh, Jessica Wright, uh, you asked a question about Title I schools, and it, it uh, seems to me maybe you have an insight into an opportunity that may be there um, if you're associated with the Title I school. Would you want to comment on that just for the benefit? Um, we haven't, since the children that we're, that I'm most familiar with in our building in our care right now are, you know, eight weeks or six weeks to, to pre-K, we haven't had a need or haven't had the experience to deal with students that are um, in a Title I position. Um, this flyer was put out to the public, so anyone is eligible to attend. We haven't worked on any additional funding to supplement Title I students at this time. And Jessica, would you want to add anything um, or share anything about an opportunity you see related to Title I schools? Well, sure. And I'll also defer to Mary Beth because a lot of this is coming out of um, her heart and passion as it expresses itself at First Allen. Um, but I know that our church is located exactly between uh, two, the two Title I elementary schools in Allen, um, one mile exactly from each one of them. Mm -hmm. And so when we're thinking about children who are most at risk, and especially older siblings who might not have an opportunity to successfully complete their own learning because they are helping their younger siblings successfully complete theirs. Um, our first thought were those Title I students who may not be able, because there are some places in our local context who are providing um, a virtual learning support center. I think that's a great way to phrase it. Um, you know, we have a local gymnasium uh, that will have, but a lot of these are out of the reach of a lot of students who might be, um, most at need, uh, you know, in need of, of some services. And so I think um, our questions and our focus have been around those schools. Um, in those schools, because of the funding that comes with Title I, they're, they call them in our district care coordinators, and we have close relationships with them. Um, whenever we need to get information to families because of the limitations of privacy around the school district, we put it in the hands of the care coordinators and ask them to pass it along because they know those families. Um, and they also serve families because there's poverty in every school, not just those Title I schools. Um, so when a, st a student leaves elementary and goes on to middle school, they know what middle school they're in and how to reach that family. Um, they also serve as a contact for all of the schools in Allen. So um, that's been a great connection point for us to be able to reach out to those families, um, even though we can't directly email them or mail them ourselves. But putting it in those care coordinators' hands gets it there. Yes, they could be a real ally in this work. Um, actually, uh, one more question about facilitators. I see Freddie Orr is asking, just um, where are you finding your facilitators? Is there a, a source that, that you found that is helpful if we're trying to put this together? Uh, mostly it's been word of mouth. Um, I have some, I myself am retired from the school district. I have some connections with educators that are retired. Um, friends of friends who were 
anxious to, you know, or wanting to do something um, to help out, we support the one plus one reading program and Stacy Cook, in, who is in charge of that at our church, had suggested that maybe some of those individuals might be looking for an opportunity to help students since they're not going to be able to go into the public schools and help them. So that might be another resource for us. I did speak with um, a potential employee for the afternoon. She has experience working with children. She's been a longtime member of our church, grew up in our church, and she additionally has management skills from her um, previous job. So I thought she would be a great afternoon person to be here to take care of, you know, any busy business issues that may arise. Um, and just be a great facilitator for the afternoon and, and kind of be in charge of the afternoon shift. So she's a potential candidate that we've looked at also. Yeah, there's several um, comments and questions about just the, managing the relationship between having a licensed childcare facility or program in a church and then trying to add this alongside it. Uh, Kiva Green at Cedar Hill specifically asked if we already have a licensed childcare that covers all the hours of the day um, and includes after school um, programming. Is there any reason why this kind of program couldn't be included in that, in that existing facility? So for Bonnie, from your standpoint, what do you, how would you respond to that? We had, I had thought about that. I was like, that would be an easy transition. They will just go downstairs because our faith pair our faith prep children will have the ability to utilize the before and after school care at Academy Kids. But once I talked with some people and thought about it some more, the whole reason parents are keeping their children home, or one of the major reasons, is that fear. So if we can keep the pods of children or the groups of children smaller and have less interaction, that would reduce the risk of anyone transmitting germs upstairs, downstairs. We don't wanna do anything in any way to jeopardize their downstairs program. So we wanna keep this separate from, and that's why we decided to use the childcare timeline up here to you know, help the parents and keep the children safe from our downstairs facility and as safe as possible upstairs. And uh, for everyone, I do wanna, in case you're not tracking it, just want to call your attention to the chat. There's a lot of um, additional resourcing, um, good ideas that are emerging there. Um, I'll, I'll do my best to capture the chat and um, get that out as well, you know, for future reference. Um, so Catherine Sturmke is asking about sort of the medical um, inspection piece of this. Just uh, how, how are you doing medical inspections? And she said, not just for COVID, but other you know, typical school kinds of things like lice. Um, mm -hmm. What can you tell us about that? Well, as we stated, downstairs is um, under state guidelines and to en in order to enter the building, there is a keypad. Um, they have temporarily suspended the parent codes, which means that an, an, an Academy Kids employee must let you into the building. You have to wear a face mask to enter the building and then temperatures are checked. When children are dropped off, they take the temperature of the parent and the child. And then each day when the children leave, their temperatures are checked. So we will follow that same procedure. In order to get into the building, you will have to use those guidelines that are in place downstairs. Additionally, we'll be doing um, cleaning throughout the day as needed. And then in the evening, they do a deep clean sanitization with a handheld power spray mist that's been um, approved and purchased. So we'll be using those um, pieces of equipment at, throughout the day and then in the evening. Great, so uh, there, were, there was questions about just your cleaning protocols. You spoke to some of those just now. Um, so uh, yeah, uh, Jessica Wright was asking um, this question. So, you know, basically families are enrolling their students for a fee. Uh, in this program. So what kinds of agreements or policies or protocols um, do you ha have in place? I guess I gather even like what agreements are the parents making um, in order to responsibly participate in this program? So. Okay, a, an online enrollment form has been created and it mirrors our faith prep enrollment form. 
which goes under pretty much the guidelines from downstairs. I'm using downstairs um, as a reference a lot because I feel that if they're under state guidelines, then we're going to follow them, even though we're not required to. We're going to follow them as best and as closely as possible if it will you know, help us and be a positive thing. I'm in the process of creating the parent handbook. Um, I was working on that yesterday and I've created a whole COVID paper for the first that tells it lays out you know specifically what guidelines we will be following and the reason for those guidelines and what um, procedures and policies are in place so the faith prep and the virtual learning handbook will virtually be the same and those will be available to the parents and there will be an acknowledgement form that they will sign stating that they have received it online or they have access to it once they enroll we will give them access to that document online and then they will sign the form stating that they you know have access to it and hopefully have read it All right and uh, there was a jessica had a follow-up um particularly around um you know just how you what policies you have in place or how you intend to handle discipline um issues and i guess i would add because i know this has come up in various conversations i've been a part of um, you know, how would you handle non-compliance with your expectations for students and families, whether whether that's wearing masks or social distancing? Um, you know, how how do you intend to handle non potential non-compliance, right? Well, we will train the facilitators on basic. I mean, they do have they the, the potential employees will have basic information about um, student management, classroom management. If there is an issue that is becoming, or if a child becomes an issue as far as a behavior concern, um, taking them out of the room to have a conversation, they might need to come into my office. Um, I've got extra space in here where we can set up a little you know, time, take them for a little walk around the hallway, remove them. Um, we intend to have, and I'm pretty sure that the districts are not expecting the children to sit for a long time. So have little movement breaks, um, little, you know, songs, jumping, moving, so that they can, you know, re go to the restroom, get their drink, so not have them glued to the screen, but allow them and be aware and be on guard for watching when there seems to be a need for a break for a student. Good. I think, uh, I think we've lifted up most all of the questions in the chat. Are there any other any other questions that anybody here in the group want to pose to um, our excellent folks from First Mesquite? Yes, Maggie. That last, excuse me, that last comment about the internet service bandwidth for additional use. We have 5G, we, we use Spectrum. Uh, Bonnie's office is upstairs in the building. They just installed it, so we believe we have adequate bandwidth for the number of students. We expanded beyond that initial number of students. We may be reaching a capacity issue, but I think we're okay on that. Got the latest and greatest equipment from broadband or from Spectrum. Yeah, but that, that does raise an important consideration for any of us thinking about offering this, yeah. Y'all okay. see how lucky I am to have Bonnie? <laughs> I didn't have to say anything. This is great. This is my first time doing anything like this, so. <laughs> I'm, I'm telling people I'm on a huge learning curve. It's, it's you know, coming together, but it's, it's taken a lot of input from um, friends, educators, pastor, church members, you know, people like you who are bringing attention to things that I haven't thought of. So I appreciate this time. So uh, there was, there's one more question I see that's come here just in the last minute. Um, and that is just concerns about liability. Um, is that something that you all have thought through? Um, how are you, how are you addressing that concern? Okay, my, I just had a little interruption. Did you say concerns about liabilities? Yes. Well, <laughs> um, that's, yeah, that's one thing that we, I haven't focused on, I guess, in an embarrassing way to say that. Tom, is there some insight you could help me with here? 
Yeah, I think the, the issue of liability is going to be across anything you do, no matter how good, good it is. But we may look at the Academy Kids program and what their policy on liability, because we're following those state standards as closely as possible. The student handbook or the parent handbook will probably have a statement. We probably need to have that statement in there, similar to what Academy Kids has on liability. That, that we have covered the insurance company the, you know, per incident, things of that nature. We do have an emergency plan in place. Yeah, and Catherine's comment. In the handbook that exactly parents right. sign you know, in case there were their child were to be injured. Um, we, we are wanting them to have their shot, shot records. Um, all the guidelines that they are following downstairs. We'll just follow through up here. Even though we have that exemption, it's just a really good working model downstairs. Yeah, and I know this concern about um, liability has come up um, as churches have thought about reopening and being in ministry during this time. And, you know, the, the standard response is that um, and we've explored this with our insurance carrier. Um, we're not, you know, we're not covered. We're not released from all liability um, should someone get sick uh, by coming to worship with us or being a part of a, a program or ministry at our church. Um, uh, and there's nothing that we can do to prevent someone from filing a suit. That's just the reality of, um, you know, the, the way things go in Texas. However, again, what we have instructed church leaders like you all to do is, is that if you all, uh, for a program like this, if you have, uh, if you've uh, obviously shown your due diligence to meet the uh, state standards for safety and health and well-being of students in a child care kind of facility, if you've done your due diligence for training your facilitators, if you've done your due diligence and, and can document that, then you're well positioned to be able to, to manage anything that comes your way. So, you know, the key is just to be, to be thoughtful, to be um, careful, to document um, your plan and do your due diligence. Um, all right, so good, a good question. Um, everyone from uh, you know, school districts to Major League Baseball are trying to figure this one out. <laughs> So, you know, what, what happens if a, a child or a facilitator tests positive for COVID? What's the plan? Um, okay, I did get that part yesterday. I've created, I'm sorry, I'm flipping to here. Oh, I talked about if they're experiencing suspected or actual symptoms, the child must be kept at home and we must be notified of his or her condition. It's imperative that a sick child and their family members not be on the premises. Um, if a child does develop a fever or other possible symptoms during the school day, the child will be isolated and must be picked up um, as soon as possible. If a child were to test positive, he or, must, he or she must stay home for the 14 days even if the family, if, or if a family member tests positive, and then we would need medical documentation stating that the child can return to care. And what about the kids that are interacting with him or her? I'm sorry? What about the students that have been um, close to them, to that uh, student? You if mean, that student is um, suspicious to be positive, or has been tested positive, what mm -hmm. about the kids that are with him during that day or during the week? We would have to suggest then that those ch that child also be tested, contact their medical provider and have them tested. That's so a really good question. potentially the impact could be on a whole pot. Right, mm -hmm. and that's a really good question. And I think that's something we'll probably yeah. ask the school board because so, they're gonna have the exact same issue as parents are sending kids back to school you're in a first grade classroom, the kid tests positive. And I suspect, Bonnie, we'll follow what the MISD policy is on that because they have had to go through that drill, figuring, figuring how to handle that. Because you're right, those, all those children within that classroom would potentially be exposed to it. Uh, Along Catherine, with the you may, facilitators. Yeah, and the facilitator. So now, that's something now, we're going to have research the school district. Yeah, now we have to put those in, in quarantine, all of them. 
probably, right? Yes. So this, there's a, a, a question, this, uh, Tom, this may be for you to respond to. Um, I know that as I look at folks on this call, uh, many of us are serving churches that are not uh, yet open for in-person worship. And yet, you know, we're considering uh, a program like this that obviously will bring people together in person on our campus for something. Um, Tom, is that your reality? And, and if so, how are you managing um, maybe just uh, different reactions people in your church may have about that? Like, well, I can imagine a comment like this. Well, if we can have students on our campus Monday through Friday, how come we can't come together for church on Sunday? So I, I love our bishop. I love our bishop. I just I just hold that letter up and say, here, that's why. You know, no, seriously, <laughs> that that's a great question. And fortunately, that has not come up. But I think it's not come up because we have Academy Kids downstairs in a separate in the separate building. And people are aware that that's going on. They're aware that Faith Prep is starting as a private kindergarten. And this is an extension. This is under the Faith Prep director, Bonnie. This is under the Faith Prep umbrella, the Virtual Learning Support Center. It's a natural progression of serving a need in the community. And uh, so I believe that the, if the question does come up, uh, which I seriously doubt it will, I'll point to the fact that this is part of the virtual, uh, the uh, Faith Prep program, which we've been planning for, for opening for a long time. And, um, and that it, speaks directly to our mission, directly to the mission of the church. Uh, so I, I don't think we'll get that, that comment. And we are not worshiping in, in person. We are not live worship. Thanks, Tom. And I, I would add to that, um, I know I've been a part of a number of conversations along these lines. Um, uh, in general, while the bishop um, in, the, in Dallas County and the Metro District in particular, um, other parts of our conference has uh, continued to um, ask that churches not reopen for in-person worship. Um, the, the conference, the bishop has granted um, the preschools, daycares, et cetera, even in those areas uh, to reopen. And, and we really are viewing, um, you know, Sunday morning worship versus uh, preschool kinds of experiences as just separate the apples and oranges. And part of that is because, uh, well, just the nature of a school, uh, preschools in general in our churches, they're led by um, certified trained professionals who are accustomed to meeting state standards for health and safety, et cetera. In some ways, this is nothing new. There's another layer of expectation, um, but they're kind of, they're doing what they typically do. And well, we, 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 there are other arguments, but the point is that um, this is not unlike that. We have preschools preparing to open in the fall, even in churches where they're not reopening for Sunday morning in-person worship. So that's pretty typical across the conference. Um, so uh, d uh, Tom and, and Bonnie, did you all uh, clear this program through kind of your church decision-making bodies, trustees, church council, if you have a reopening task force, is that something that you all have considered or, or done? Yes, uh, when this idea, first of all, faith prep, went through all the proper channels to get support and approvals. And then when Bonnie came to us with this virtual learning support center, I took it first to the uh, SPRC, just because Bonnie director let them know this is sort of an additional duty she'll have. And then to the finance committee, the trustees had already approved use of the facility upstairs. So there wasn't an issue with trustees. Uh, we didn't have to make any physical modifications to the building. And then took it to church council, a Zoom call. We had a long finance committee meeting about a bunch of stuff. And virtual learning support center was supported 100% by all the uh, committees and, and task force we had to go through. There, there wasn't a question. It was 100% support. Right. But we hear we hear that you did move through those yes. steps, which that's had, yeah you got to got to check the boxes. Yeah, very good. And additionally, we have an education board who's been supportive and yeah. is aware and, and been in the decision making process. Thanks. Forgot about them. That's a, that's an <laughs> important box that we needed to check. Yes. 
they've been a great support. Very good. Any other questions? Um, again, either for our folks from First Mesquite or just to the whole group about this particular uh, ministry opportunity? Excuse me, this is Freddie. I have yes. a question that I wanted to, to bring up. I've got it in the chat, but have you thought about the standpoint of making sure your parents understand that your facilitators are not teachers? Because I can see that there's going to be a total different expectation as to what they are expecting to happen with their, with their child versus school versus a program like this. So how are you going to make sure that they understand? The facilitator is basically there to help them navigate their, their online work and where they can assist them in being able to work through some of that work, but they are not teachers. And I can see some people kind of going, well, hey, you know, your teacher didn't do with my kid so-and-so. Well, that's one of the reasons why we were calling them facilitators to try to make that right from the start that, you know, and let them know that, and the word support put in the, the title of the facility so that they understand that we are here to help and not to be the sole responsible person for the education, but to support the education that they're receiving from their district to support their learning, their, their, um, student's teacher. Good. All right. This, uh, I, people have mentioned it in the chat. I'll just echo. Uh, this has been excellent. Uh, again, Tom and Bonnie, I appreciate you all so much. Um, again, Catherine, for raising the question a couple of days ago in the beginning, and for everyone um, having the patience to wait maybe another another day to have this conversation so even more folks can be a part of it. Um, this has been really helpful. I think I think what I'd propose we do, I've got 1055. Um, I, don't, I suspect some folks tuned in today just to hear about this particular ministry opportunity. Um, and so I wanna kind of uh, bring this conversation to a close and uh, and give if that's you that you just really wanted to hear about this give you an opportunity uh, to step away graciously um, if you want to just hang on this call and be a part of a broader kind of brainstorming conversation about other ways that the church could possibly uh, be in ministry with students families teachers etc uh, during this particular season um, then hang on and we can do that for maybe another 15 or 20 minutes um, before we uh, before we finish. So it's 1056. Why don't we pause uh, for three, four minutes, let folks step away, let all of us stretch our legs. And if you want to hang on for that general brainstorming conversation, we'll resume that at 11. All right. Andy, let me make one point in the comments and, uh, about the licensing rep. I think that's a, in the comment section is excellent. We have Academy Kids downstairs, Faith Prep and the Virtual Learning Support Center upstairs. They are completely separate entities and that's very important. If you have an existing childcare facility of really any sort, you need to think through and make sure if it's licensed by the state of Texas, there's no linkage between the two. There's no linkage whatsoever. Our Academy Kids is a separate program. Now, we're using a lot of the protocols and paperwork and policies, uh, but it's very clear to the parents and to the, our state rep that upstairs is completely separate. Mm -hmm. uh, and I guess before we, the, another good topic has come up, I'll just speak to you briefly, uh, concerns about um, funding, about, uh, you know, parents in some circumstances being able to afford uh, to have their children in an opportunity like this. Um, yeah, I think, uh, so in general, the conference, I hope you all are, are well aware, um, has been very proactive to try to offer grant funding uh, to help churches step into moments um, for ministry here during the pandemic. And so I know the Center for Missional Outreach currently still has 
um, open grants for, we call them rural missional grants. So if you're in a rural context, um, you could definitely apply for a grant to under, uh, uh, to support uh, a, a ministry like this. And then we also have, um, uh, I forget the exact title of it, but basically a grant um, that is aimed at, if your church, if by doing this, you would be meeting the needs of um, under-resourced communities in your area, like Title I schools in particular. Uh, but again, for families who couldn't afford this, I think uh, a program like this would definitely qualify for that kind of grant as well. If you want to explore that more with me offline, feel free to shoot me an email. Um, but I know on the website, we have information about those grant opportunities. So, um, so yeah, if, if you're all in and eager to do this and see a need to fill a funding gap, uh, I'm open to that conversation. I think we have already grant, grant opportunities for this sort of thing. So, um, so let's uh, shift gears a little bit. Um, we know that uh, plans for reopening, um, is, they're creating um, different kinds of stress points and anxieties and needs. Um, again, we've already broached the subject of teachers, I mean, students and parents, but for teachers in particular um, as well. And so uh, actually I would propose we start there. Um, uh, we know, again, teachers are uh, being asked to uh, do what they do under um, kind of new and stressful conditions. They're being asked in some ways to make a choice between their own health and well-being and keeping their job and, and fulfilling their vocation. Um, and they're being asked to uh, become special. Like, they're a lot like pastors in many ways in recent months. They're being asked to become specialists and how to manage uh, a communicable disease that's new um, when that maybe isn't, that's not their training and, and they're trying to have to figure out how to do that in a wise and responsible way. So I guess I would, I would try to start this conversation by asking uh, what, what ideas do we have for uh, coming alongside and supporting and being in ministry with, with teachers in our community in this time? And I think at this point, uh, we don't have to be limited to the chat. If you have an idea, um, you know, unmute yourself and share that with the group. We'll just try to have a conversation together. Well, this sounds kind of small, but I mean, it's at least probably, you know, a little step in the right direction. Um, we typically had had a back to school, like a, a backpack blessing each year. And of course this year, things in the season of COVID, everything looks different. So we're having a drive-through back to school blessing. And every time we would do this, we invite not only students, but teachers, administrators, et cetera. And we usually have a little goodie we give them. Well, this year our goodie is a mask um, because we feel like everybody might need one and at least to put one in rotation that you can wash. And um, we've got the, we've got loving, uh, God loving neighbor on this one and um, something we can provide to, be a tangible piece of our love and support for students and teachers and administrators and staff and all those folks. That's a great idea. I know we do blessings of the backpack and staff members who are uh, church members participate, but that's wonderful that you invite, you know, neighboring schools in the district. I love that idea. That's really special. <laughs> So when do you do it, Jessica? So oh, Alan ISD's start date is August 12th, early. Um, my, I'm in Melissa and we don't start till the 25th. And the, the plan for what Melissa's doing is supposed to come out sometime today. Um, we're going to do the drive-through parade on the 9th, which I think is the Sunday prior. So we're gonna invite them to drive through. Um, Pastor Mary Beth and I will be available to bless them in whatever way feels good to them. If they don't keep windows up, that's fine. If they want to roll them down, everybody mask. Um, we'll have a photo op available if they want to park and get out of the car. There's like a place over there, you know, that they can go to and take their back to school pictures because that's also 
just different and weird this year. So, but this, this question of how to support our teachers is a hard one because I know um, it's been a risk your life or get out of here um, kind of experience for a lot of teachers, what we're hearing. So I wonder, uh, I don't, anyway, I wonder if um, there's an opportunity for um, communities of faith to become advocates for teachers in a way that feels authentic and a way that's welcome by the teachers in your community. You know, that might be an interesting conversation to have with teachers who are a part of your church or teachers that you are connected to in some way to ask them, you know, how, how might people in the community advocate for you and your concerns? What are your anxieties? What are um, steps you'd like to see the powers that be take to ensure your safety and to really be thinking about you? And then how, how could um, a church um, you know, express that concern to you know, the powers that be, whether that's um, TEA or your state representative, or I mean, there may be an advocacy role that you could play or that you know, a, a large number of people in your church could play. Well, I know my experience when I taught in Mesquite, we actually had a church that adopted our campus and they were there. They provided breakfast one morning during that back to school time. They were there for play day activities. And um, throughout the year, in fact, one year, the, the pastor um, emceed the talent show. I mean, they were on campus for like, we would do a winter wonderland activities and they would volunteer and be on campus. And I know in our church, we have that connection with an elementary school with the one plus one program. So maybe we can incorporate the back to school drive through backpack blessing with that school. I mean, they're not far from here. Uh, we have a high school that's, you know, a 6A high school right down the street. So now that you've mentioned that, like my brain's going with how, what ways we can incorporate, you know, our community in a, in a whole new way by just being here for them and supporting them. I think that's a great suggestion. I love that virtual backpack drive through with schools. I know we've talked about our family members, but I don't think we've explored opening it up to a larger amount of people. So I think that's something that we need to focus on. Hi, this is Martha Stowe. And for some reason my video won't work, <laughs> but um, we work with several schools and the, the principals have been asking us to send um, kind of uh, ongoing notes of encouragement to the teachers, mm -hmm. which seems like something everybody could do. But I was surprised by that. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, I'm sure many of us I'm sure have seen um, in the public space, um, you know, this conversation uh, about teachers that um, while uh, in the spring when everyone was at home, there was a lot of talk about how uh, much we should appreciate teachers and wow, you know, I didn't realize how difficult um, instructing my children would be and there was a real groundswell of support and love for teachers but I now I, I mean I have a teacher in my home so I know that now they're feeling like well that's been forgotten because now we're once again being taken for granted and just assumed that as it's been said we'll we'll step in and risk our lives and do this and uh, you know where was all that love we had in the spring so so there probably is um, a deep need for that kind of appreciation, just notes of encouragement and appreciation that could go a long way. This is Kiva. Um, we set up last year uh, where we have prayer partners uh, with all the teachers and every worker at Bray Elementary. Bray Elementary's like kind of catty cornered from our uh, property. And so we've supported them. So we've supported them through the year anyway with notes, you know, once a month and gifts for the teachers and cafeteria workers and principal and everybody else. And so we've done that for the last year. And so just trying to continue to do that uh, through all this, even though they were doing it online, um, but realize that we need to 
really reach out to them right now. I, I, each person has a, a prayer partner that's there to support them, but realizing that we probably need to be doing even more. So, so in the ch thank you, Kiva. In the in the chat, I saw uh, Catherine Sturmke shared a wish list from their partner school about some school supplies. Uh, again, I have an educator in my home. One of the dynamics um, that not everyone's aware of is that uh, most teachers uh, have to buy a lot of their own supplies for their classroom. Um, my wife got a notice this week that uh, that extends to PPE that, you know, there's an expectation that teachers be masked, but the district's not taking responsibility for providing that. Uh, that's on the teachers. So, um, so, you know, Jessica mentioned about masks in a, you know, kind of a, a gift package, but um, if that experience is true across the board, teachers probably would really appreciate um, being provided masks and hand sanitizer and gloves and, um, and other kinds of personal protective gear that um, will help them do their jobs. They'll be expected to have it, but they're expected to get it. Exactly. So there, there's an opportunity there. I know in the past, our women's group has done um, back to school supply drive. I'm wondering if we could do it this year, but have a different set of guidelines or a different set of supplies like the materials that we're needing. I know some are difficult to find, but instead of doing like the usual crayons and everything, do the wipe sanitizer masks that would give people an opportunity to participate by donating as well as the receiving end of it. So I need to maybe get with our um, United Methodist Women's Group and maybe make that suggestion to them or have a discussion with them about that. I think that's a great idea also. And that way it gives opportunity for congregational members who might be feeling you know, disconnected at this time to have an ability to provide something or the letter writing and note writing. I mean, I'm thinking of people who have that ability, but just maybe don't have a connection to a group to provide those, those notes and those cards. I know we have people who write cards regularly, but to include the teachers, I think that's a fabulous idea. That would serve several purposes. I saw something over in the chat um, that talked about school supply collections. We're still participating in ours. Our local helping agency, um, ACO, um, it used to be Allen Community Outreach, now it's all community outreach. Um, they're going to park an Allen ISD bus here on Saturday and we're going to try to fill it up. Um, and then we're also uh, partnering with one of our Title I schools because some of those families don't go to helping agencies to receive assistance because of concerns about where information you provide to any organization might go. Um, and so we're also doing a collection for one of our elementary schools. Um, I think a lot of the folks are, the way I understand it, the surface contact potential, if it sits for a moment for a few days before they distribute them, which they should be able to do, um, the risk is really low. So I think what they're planning to do is basically quarantine the items and then distribute them. Good. This has been helpful about teachers. Um, you know, I don't want to belabor the conversation, um, but I do want to uh, shift a little and provide a space for thinking a bit more about parents. I mean, obviously, we began with a really creative significant idea for coming alongside parents. Um, but are there other ways that we can be in ministry with parents of students at this time? I mean, think a little bit about it. Uh, uh, parents who feel like they uh, must send their kids back to in-person school for one reason or another, um, for economic reasons or just because they desperately need the support. Um, they're probably dealing with some guilt uh, feelings. Uh, parents who keep their kids at home um, are taking on um, an additional burden and I mean they're going to oh, manage that in different ways but this uh, wears on for nine weeks for a semester. It's only going to become more and more challenging. Um, yeah Jessica put it well it just feels like there's no there's no great choice here. Everyone's <laughs> making a, the less bad choice. So um, so again, are there, are there 
ways that we can think about the church being in ministry with parents um, in this time. I think that one of the things we can do is to support whatever decision parents make. And, um, you know, people ask me all the time, what's the right answer? And I, I can argue either side easily. And so I think that's what's important is to be there no matter which way they go and, and be supportive of that. Good word. All right, friends, again, this, this has been a, a fruitful conversation. Uh, all of you came to this for one reason or another. Um, does anyone have any particular um, itch that hadn't been scratched uh, or any idea that you just really want to make sure gets out there to the group before we, before we wrap up for the morning? I was having a, a side chat with um, one of our folks. Um, I found a great resource, a prayer for back to school um, that I can send somewhere so we don't have to linger while I type this all into the chat, but um, it might be a helpful resource. Um, just, you know, nothing, nothing like a good liturgy. Mm -hmm. uh, Jenna Johnson just said she's got um, a resource is being put together about tips for parents that might be Jenna, maybe if you want that to be widely shared, uh, feel free to send that to me. That may be something we can disseminate um, through us. Good. Um, so again, uh, Tom and Bonnie said they would send me some materials about their program. Uh, once I have those, I'll be sure to uh, post those in various ways, probably on our COVID-19 resource page, but also on the CMO website in a, in a, in a place that's obvious. Um, and we'll probably put them out in our newsletter uh, that's going to be coming up in a couple weeks. So, uh, but if you want to contact me directly for those items as well, um, feel free to do that. All right. Very good. Um, again, I, I, in general, I just I commend you all for being on this call. I mean, we've been saying for years that um, uh, a place where there is a rich harvest um, is within our neighborhood schools. And as we cultivate our relationship with those schools, it presents all kinds of great opportunities for ministry. Um, so again, I appreciate you all for recognizing that and for living into that in this time. Um, and I hope we all uh, I mean, recognize an important lesson about how this particular call emerged. Um, if there's a, a conversation that happens um, I mean, just via text between you and a colleague or on Facebook, and it begins to feel like it's growing and could be useful to others. Um, I mean, let's try to, I mean, know all of us um, in, in our roles here at the conference office, Cami, Owen, and I in particular, uh, we'd be happy then to be looped in and, um, and host something that can, again, invite more people to benefit from the conversation. So anyway, this has been great. God bless you all. Um, Go in peace, and uh, we'll see you again soon. Bye-bye, everybody.